Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, wherever you are located uh, to today's briefing. Um, uh, my name is Carsten Obens. I'm the executive director of the European Leadership Network in Germany. And uh, it's my pleasure of opening and also moderating this call. As most of you who are with us um, more often, if not every Monday, you know that uh, usually on Mondays we invite our supporters and, and our network for a briefing on current issues uh, regarding the Europe-Israeli relations. And these days, uh, unfortunately, uh, we do not come ar around the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and what it means for the future of Europe and the Middle East. So. Um, as we all know, the horrors, the brutal Russian invasion continues to unfold and the future of the world order as we know it and knew it for many years, European security and also the global economy hang in the balance. And uh, unfortunately, this, this whole disaster also has uh, another impact on, on the Middle East. And that's what we're going to discuss today, uh, what it means for Israel and the Middle East and also for Europe-Israeli relations. It's my very pleasure to have Sarah Masha Feinberg with us. She's an adjunct professor of Israeli affairs. Um, you may know her um, and, and be aware that uh, she's a foreign policy and security advisor, researcher, lecturer, and author um, uh, focusing on Russian, Eurasian, and Middle East policies. In addition to her role at the Center for Jewish Civilization, Dr. Feinberg also lectures at the Tel Aviv University Faculty of Social Sciences. And among other things, uh, she's also affiliated to Columbia University's Herman Institute. Um, she also previously served as a policy advisor at the Israeli Ministries of Defense. Um, yes, we planned to, to do um, a different briefing, not a different topic, but to, to have another um, uh, speaker today. Uh, in this crisis, things change uh, a lot. So I'm, I'm uh, extra uh, thankful, grateful, Sarah, that you could ma make it here, uh, being um, a, a senior expert on, on the issue that uh, we deal with today. So um, I would say let's let's start right away. So I wonder um, if, if to begin with, um, um, speaking about the Russian war on Ukraine, maybe you could say, okay, what actually does it mean? The Russian war on Ukraine binds many forces of Russia. So starting with the region, what does this mean for the Middle East, Russian involvement in, in Syria, for example? What does it mean for the stability of the Middle East and, and for Israel in particular to start with? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to speak today with the friends of Elnet and especially to see uh, David Siegel and uh, Larry here. Um, in terms of uh, the implications for the Middle East, first of all, it's early to tell. We are at a very early stage of this war that could unfold for weeks and for months with Russia's position that is today quite weak, uh, that could transition to a more powerful position in the weeks to come. But if we were to do a, a very quick overview of the general implications for the Middle East, the first implication is a greater instability, a greater instability in the energy sector, a greater instability in uh, the food and wheat sector that could provoke a domino effect of um, a food crisis in the Middle East. And we, and you know very well that in Egypt, in Jordan, in Lebanon, this could lead to very, very uh, devastating effects also on, at the political level. What it means as well, it means a potential um, I would say diminishing of prestige of Russia. Since the early 2010, Russia has very skillfully managed to impose itself as an unavoidable actor on the Middle East, in the Middle East arena, with many US allies, including Israel, uh, Egypt, Jordan, um, uh, and others 
and uh, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, and Turkey turning for Russia, to Russia, for developing alternative defense economic cooperation. Russia uh, in itself used that situation to um, impose itself as the main exporter of arms to the Middle East. We know that in the Middle East, Russian arms exports have increased by 40% in the past decade, and that the Middle East is becoming slowly Russia's first export destination for arms. Uh, so I would suspect that all these actors are observing the discrepancy between Russia's strategic goals in Eurasia and globally and its operational and technical uh, success or lack of success in Ukraine. And I believe that this gap may very significantly impact Russia's position as one, a defense partner, a reliable defense partner in the Middle East, and second, as a reliable arms exporter. Add to this the long-term impact of the US and European sanctions on Russia, including on the defense exports, and I believe that Russia's core positioning, core standing in the Middle East, might be eroded in the decade to come. This will have an impact on Turkish-Russian relations, Saudi-Russian relations, and potentially, who knows, on Iranian-Russian relations. I would like to this. Uh, I would like to add to this that uh, the raging war in Ukraine has one single main winner, and this main winner is China. China that has refrained from being involved in the Ukrainian front lines. China that could be the key peacemaker in that crisis, and China that will benefit uh, by contrast to Russia's challenging, to Russia's uh, already defeat in Ukraine. Even if Russia wins that war, strategically speaking and operationally speaking, it will lose that war in the eyes of the Middle East actors. So that means that China could be greatly strengthened in front of Iran, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt, Turkey, Syria, and you know, potentially Israel. So I think that ultimately this crisis will shift the uh, current lines of Middle East politics and the building of alliances uh, at the benefit of China. Another point that I wanna make, all US allies and US enemies as well, um, observe the potential effects of US abandonment. They observe the uncoupling, uncoupling between economic deterrence and a defense and military deterrence. This has been the policy of NATO and the United States. Economically speaking, in the realm of sanctions, we're gonna apply the maximum pressure policy, but we'll never push in or uh, connect it with the military deterrence component. And I think that this is a very strong message to the Middle East actors that are, will it or not, pushed to develop the strategic autonomy in the Middle East arena. So I think that at an initial level, and very recently I wrote an article in Elnet with my colleague Daniel Rakov on this issue, at an initial level, they will try to keep this very fine balancing act between Washington and Moscow that is what Israel is doing, the Saudis are doing, and Turkey is doing. But ultimately, five years or 10 years from now, they will be pushed 
to develop the strategic autonomy in that area uh, and the strategic and the autonomous decision making when it comes to major crises. Another element, Karstein, that I would like to put on the table for a discussion is that this crisis is already triggering uh, the crystallization of new or of renewed alliances. And I think that Turkey and Israel is a case in point. Turkey and Israel are the only Middle East countries that step in and that try to mediate this crisis between Ukraine and Russia. At the same time, Turkey is leveraging this crisis to initiate or trigger a rapprochement with the United States, using Israel as the best way to facilitate this rapprochement with Washington. So you already see this triangle, Washington, Ankara, and Jerusalem being crystallized as an effect of this crisis. I'm not saying that the war in Ukraine is creating this alliance. I'm saying that the war in Ukraine is precipitating already existing processes. And that's what is we seeing uh, with Turkey and Israel. And I believe we're going to see the same, uh, a deep rapprochement between Israel, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, the countries of the Abraham Accords, Israel and Egypt also, that are going to be, will it or not, pushed to strengthen their defense dialogue and cooperation uh, in front of those turbulent developments in which uh, the image of the vanishing United States is being strengthened. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah, already for, for this broad uh, tour de raison uh, through all the um, various strategic aspects of, of this Russian war on Ukraine. <clears throat> Uh, many many questions I would I would love to to uh, ask and do uh, deep dives on on several issues. Um, let's let's maybe start with with something related to trade. As you said, that uh, Russia is a regional power and a major arms exporter to the region. So how likely is it? Do you think that uh, Arab states will will now ally with the Western world? Um, imposing sanctions, severe sanctions on Russia, stopping arms imports from, from Russia and following suit to all the uh, European slash transatlantic uh, sanctions regimes that we now installed? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, I would say that the first um, question mark uh, for Middle East uh, Russia clients is how effective are Russian technologies? Because what we've seen, Karstin, in the Ukrainian front lines, we've seen um, a revelation or a laboratory of Russia's uh, effective, um, uh, of Russia's real uh, power of fire. It is one thing for Russia to display 40 uh, or 20 fighter jets to the Syrian front lines. It is one thing for Russia to display hypersonic missiles in Syria against you know, NATO's pressure, presence in the Eastern Mediterranean. It is another thing to display a very wide variety of weapons, air, artillery, cyber, electronic warfare in the biggest country of Europe. And I think that what we've seen, especially in the first days of war, we've seen the real um, cover story or the real behind, this, behind the scenes story of the Russian army. The Russian army is a very dual paradoxical entity. On the one hand, you have a very performing and very sophisticated Russian theory of war. For those of us who read 
Russian military journals on a, on a daily basis, I would say that Russia has the most sophisticated theory and concepts of war. It is one thing to develop those um, cutting edge, uh, state of the arts, new technologies, you know, the Kinjal and the hypersonic missiles uh, that has very, very strong, um, I would say propaganda effects. But when you see the real state of the Russian army and the ways in which it failed completely, or I would say 70% failure during the three day, first days of war, I think that Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Egypt and Jordan, and possibly Iran will have a lot of question marks regarding the real functioning of the Russian state of the art military equipment when it comes to a large scale war, not a pinpointed uh, uh, surgical operation. So I think this will be the first question. Regarding the second question in terms of a potential alignment of the Middle East actors with the US sanctions, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think there will be, um, I think that the name of the game will be as it was in the past, to leverage the possibility of a rapprochement with Russia and of a deal with Russia to get a better deal with the United States, European companies or China. I think that Russia will be increasingly used as a backup, uh, as a backup option in order to get a more interesting deal uh, with uh, other uh, great powers in that area. But I think it's early to tell. For the moment, we've seen, Karstin, that still Turkey, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates are still very, very reluctant, uh, to, and even Israel, to align themselves completely with uh, uh, the Western position and with the Western sanctions regime. Uh, and I think that for the moment, they're trying to keep the balancing act in the hope that we're gonna get a ceasefire and potentially an agreement and that they will be able to gain or to keep some leverages on uh, both sides. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. Well. Um... You're uh, definitely right, uh, and I fully share your anal analysis. And at the end, uh, we could maybe even argue that um, realizing the weakness of, of uh, Russian arms um, results in, in the same uh, as if we would impose more sanctions on, on Russia to export arms uh, to, to the region. So the result, more or less, is the same nonetheless. A closer alignment here between uh, the Arab states and, and the West is also, I think, at least an opportunity. And we saw earlier today, um, uh, reading the news from, from Israel that uh, Foreign Minister Lapid says Israel won't be used as a means to bypass the sanctions to Russia. So Israel joins the, um, uh, well, it, uh, first time publicly announced that it will join and comply with the international sanction regime against Russia. So I think uh, th that's a very important move uh, also um, against the background of the close relations uh, Israel has with, with Russia. On the other hand, that also um, throws up the question. Uh, we saw that Prime Minister Bennett was um, uh, highly engaged, uh, trying to function as a moderator uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, so now the uh, Israeli government decides to join the, the sanction regime of the West. So what does it mean? Will Israel still try to follow the path of, of trying to moderate uh, in this war? Or, or will this position now change? Uh, will we see another development here? What, what do you think about this recent development? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. Karstin, I, I'm sorry, I just want to come back to your previous question. I think... Mm -hmm. One important point that I failed to mention, and that is very important to keep in mind, will be the long-term impact of the sanctions 
that will prevent Russia from developing state-of-the-art weapons. Russia is highly dependent on Western technologies to develop its um, hypersonic missiles and other um, military equipment. It's highly dependent on Chinese technologies. And just to close that parenthesis, I think that will be that will make Russia's um, a position as a major arms exporter much less attractive for potential clients. So just to keep that in mind. Regarding Israel's position, first of all, uh, Israel, as, as, as other actors, is dealing with a built-in dilemma. And this dilemma just, we need, I'm sure you've discussed this with General Amos Yadlin, but this is a very serious strategic dilemma. This is a dilemma between aligning itself completely with its US strategic ally, which is the bedrock of Israel's national security, but in the Middle East, where there is a sense that the US is, uh, US presence is vanishing, maybe not strategically and operationally, but at least as uh, from its point of view of power projection and image. There is the sense that the United States is vanishing. On the other hand, Israel has very high stakes with Russia. First of all, regarding its freedom of operations in Syria of the Israeli Air Force, Russia has turned a blind eye to, Ru to Israel's intense strikes, according to the international press, against the Iranians' entrenchments in Syria. Second, regarding Russia's position on the Iranian nuclear deal, this is a very important Israeli concern. And third, regarding yeah. Iran, uh, uh, Russia's position or Russia's uh, action vis-a-vis -vis its exports to Israeli enemies. I think that Russia has played a very fine line, a very fine game vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the Saudis not exporting specific arms to Iran or specific um, uh, systems to Iran and other Israeli enemies. So there is a very, very serious dilemma. And that's why Israel has adopted uh, this balancing act of having Israeli prime minister uh, being um, uh, having this role or taking that role of a mediator between Russia and Ukraine and Foreign Minister's uh, Lapid position as being the voice of the United States, of Israel aligning itself with the United States. They, they split their position and their voices to sort of keep that balancing act in a very, very complex situation. Now, uh, regarding whether it, it is tenable or not, it seems less and less tenable, less and less viable in terms of its position. But there is one thing that uh, is important, and I think it's important to President Zelensky, and I would even dare to say that there might be an American interest in this. Israel is the only Western nation that has a close military cooperation with Russia and with Ukraine. I would say that Turkey is in that position as well, but Turkey is in a difficult position with the United States and, uh, and it is always perceived that this, uh, as this NATO's you know, um, problematic actor. And I would say that Israel has could endorse this special role as a key mediator between Putin and Zelensky, even if the chance is very slim, the very fact that this possibility exists uh, has a stabilizing effect. Mm -hmm. And I would say that this is, uh, even for that just very, very slim and very, very thin possibility that should be maintained. Second, there is, I, I'm speaking with a friend of Elnet, but there is a very, very strong Israeli and Jewish subtext in that crisis. I'm sure you've discussed it with uh, General Yadlin, 
But the president of Ukraine is openly Jewish. The minister of defense of Ukraine is openly Jewish. The mayor of Kiev is openly Jewish. The head of Ukrainian opposition is openly Jewish. You have a very, very large Jewish community in Russia, a very large and involved Jewish community in Ukraine. So you, Israel is being attracted and involved as a magnet in this crisis. So Israel doesn't have so many options and cannot uh, exit the front, uh, exit the Ukrainian front lines. Now the question that Israel has, uh, and you know that President Zelensky, as we speak, our Prime Minister Bennett is discussing that option. President Zelensky is supposed to speak at the Israeli Knesset in a few days after he will speak at the US Congress on Wednesday. And the question is, will Israel provide Ukraine with defensive weapons or even with offensive weapons? So that's, this is the main Israeli dilemma. Israel has a strategic dilemma. Israel has an ethical dilemma. And Karstin, before we spoke, you know, I was in the, in the driving to my office and one of the other main questions in Israel, which is an ethical question, it has to do with Israel's raison d'être, is the question of refugees. Uh, Israel was asked by Ukraine uh, to accept a large number of refugees. Thus far, it has accepted 8,000 refugees and 250 refugees were sent back to the border. And Israel, uh, by its ethos, is not supposed to be a country of refugees, but it's supposed to be a country of Jewish immigration. So now Israel is preparing itself to welcome some 100,000 Ukrainian Jews and many thousands of Russian Jews, but it is wrestling with the excruciating ethical question of whether it should accept Ukrainian refugees just because Israel knows too well the price of a refugee not being accepted. And, you know, immediately the picture of Jewish, of Jewish refugees being sent back, you know, by the United States or by other powers is playing out. So, Karstin, we have a lot of strategic dilemmas, a lot of ethical dilemmas, and this is definitely one of the main debates today, uh, you know, in Israeli society. Thank you so much, Sarah, for all these insights. Um, um, very valuable and helpful <clears throat> in general and also in particular for, for our work. Um, I mean, you said at the, at the very beginning that it's too early uh, to um, get a full or clear picture uh, about the mid and long term developments, what this whole Russian aggression vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine will mean on the one hand for the Middle East, for Israel, on the other hand for Europe, and in particular for Europe-Israel relations. But maybe we could focus uh, for, for a second uh, on the JCPOA, because obviously while, while we, we have this uh, dispute now also between the West and Russia uh, because of the, the aggression and the war in Ukraine, on the other hand, the parties negotiate together uh, and talk about uh, the future of an Iran deal with um, uh, uh, of, of nuclear deal with Iran. So to what extent does this already impact, like the, the ongoing war of Russia, to what extent does it already impact the negotiations in Vienna? And what do you think, how will the short and midterm implications be? So this, this last question, and uh, I, I think I just got the uh, hint uh, from, from the back office that we have now also uh, our uh, speaker, Daniel, with us. So he will join us for the discussion. Please stay with us, uh, but let's focus on, on that question. And then also for, for the audience, uh, please, as usual, feel invited. Uh, after uh, one or two more questions, we'll open the floor. Uh, this session today uh, so far was at least on the record. So I need a, a hint if it will remain like this uh, or not. And, and then we'll open also, and we already have a couple of questions from the audience uh, to, to more from that. But 
Sarah, if you if you may yeah. uh, focus on on uh, implications on the Iran negotiations. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I'm sure that uh, Daniel will have a lot to, to say about this, but I think the main implication from an Israeli point of view is that the GCPOA question has been dislodged to uh, the second circle of the global attention. And therefore, the ability of Israeli leaders uh, to put pressures, to make a case uh, for the GP against the GCPOA has been greatly diminished because Russia has uh, triumphed in its uh, ability to attract the world's attention uh, to Ukraine and to Moscow. The second aspect uh, of um, the uh, uh, interconnection between the Ukrainian crisis and the GCPOA is uh, the ability of Russia or the attempt of Russia to leverage the GCPOA negotiations as a way to keep a channel of communication open with the United States and actually to blackmail the United States and other uh, European powers on the GCPOA issue. I think this is something that Russia has done in the past, creating linkages uh, uh, between uh, the Eurasian space and the GP GCPOA negotiations. And that's what Russia is trying to do at the moment. And thirdly, Iran during this crisis has felt uh, emboldened uh, in the negotiations, has uh, uh, provided a much less uh, flexible position vis-a-vis -vis the Western and European leaders because it uh, leverages uh, the war in Ukraine uh, to its advantage. So there is, there are fears in Jerusalem that the Ukraine crisis will, in effect, um, affect uh, badly uh, Israel's position vis-à-vis -vis the GCPOA uh, in the coming week or in the coming two weeks. Thank you so much, Sarah, um, for for all your insights and.